Hello, it's just me today. I thought I would read your emails. I thought I would just go through emails and respond to them. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I am your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am chair of the Couple and Family Therapy Program at Antioch University in Seattle, and I'm also a licensed psychotherapist. First email here is from listener Natasha. She writes, Hi, Dr. Kirk. I was just listening to the episode, 12 Ways to Overcome Anxiety, and your description of the anxiety felt by people with agoraphobia reminded me of what I feel in the opposite circumstance, which is a fear of being home alone all day with just my toddler. Is there a name for this? I've tried to explain the feeling to some friends who also have children, but so far, none of them seem to experience the same fear, and this always makes me feel guilty. I should enjoy being with my child, right? If we aren't able to leave the house, I fall into a feeling of frustration and worry, maybe even panic, about all the hours until my husband will be home, and if he, and if he doesn't want to go out, which is understandable because he's been at work all day, I immediately get upset, then he reacts, of course, and I feel foolish. When I'm home, I'm not able to relax because I'm needed all the time. If you read this, I sincerely thank you. Listening to the podcast has exposed so many of my fears and oddities, but in a seemingly healthy way, as well as providing enlightenment to all sorts of topics. So that's pretty great. Well, you're welcome for the podcast listener, Natasha. It's very sweet of you to say. Uh, quite honestly, it's a, uh, compliments and nice uh, messages. I don't know what word to say, but it's emails like this that make me do this podcast. So if you've ever said uh, kind words, it's it's wonderful to get, particularly because I also get really horrific emails as well. And so it's always good to know that at least some people are enjoying it. Okay, listener Natasha, what can I say about this? Well, there is a if you if you um, if you Google fear of children, you'll get what they call pedophobia. So instead of pedophilia, philia meaning love of children, which is sort of weird. It's like pedophilia. Don't we all love children? But but they use the word pedophilia, meaning you have a dysfunctional sexual attraction for children. Well, there's also pedophobia, which is the fear of children. But this is a term that usually refers to ageism against children. So in other words, when like homophobia, for instance, is a term thrown around used to mean that you believe that gay people are lesser or there's something wrong with them and you are prejudiced against against gay people uh, and lesbians and LGBT people, you're, you have a, you're homophobic. So you're not necessarily afraid of LGBTQ people. You're, you're, you have a thing against them. Well, pedophobia, pedophobia is a similar topic, similar term in that it's used to refer to your prejudice and discriminatory and perhaps treating people unfairly who are children. Things like believing that children don't have a voice or believing that all children are idiots or you're at the mall and you judge children as being entitled and, you know, this kind of stuff. It, that's typically the word. So that's not what you're talking about, uh, listener. You're talking about when you're home, you have distress when you're just home alone with your toddler and you can't wait for your husband to get home. And when your husband gets home, you're like, get me out of this house. And your husband's like, man, I've been at work all day. I just want to relax. And then although you understand that you, you have more distress because you feel like you're all cooped up in this house. Well, um, I have to sort of read between the lines in your email to provide some guidance here, but for the sake of this podcast episode, I'll, I'll, I'll say that I'm reading between the lines. I'm making a lot of assumptions in terms of what I'm about to say. And so by all means, this might not apply to you, but I'm guessing it might apply to other people. 
So first off, I'll just say that it's completely normal to feel the stress in this situation for a number of reasons. First off, babies are scary. Babies are very scary. My, it sounds like it's your first child and new parents of their first child are particularly distressed and scared because there's a lot of responsibility that is suddenly foisted upon you. And since you're home alone, you're the only person who is responsible. And if something goes wrong, it's all your fault. And that's scary. That's a very scary thing. Ask any parent who cares about their children and they will say, absolutely. With my first kid, I was terrified. I had no idea what I was doing and I, I was worried I was going to do something wrong. Now, most parents adjust and, and figure things out, but, but most parents, uh, so, so that, that distress is normal. It, it's my, I don't know if that's the sort of anxiety you're feeling, but, but if it is, then that's normal. Um, also, when there's no one there to help you, you're going to feel alone and a little confused and a little, uh, well, alone. It's not actually natural for us to raise children by ourselves. Think back to the caveman days or the days we were in trees. The whole tribe was there. You were never alone taking care of a child. It would be akin to a mother on the African savanna in the Pleistocene just wandering off all day with her, with her newborn child and trying to survive on her own. That would not be in her best interest. She would stay near her, her own siblings and her parents and her friends, and, and her husband was, would probably be close by if they had such a thing, husbands and wives in the Pleistocene. <laughs> Uh, so the, the whole thing about just staying home alone with a child, in my view is, is not natural and it doesn't, it doesn't account or doesn't, um, jive with the fact that we are not meant to be like that. We're meant to be with people. There should be other people around. So I wonder if that might be able to help you. Also, another thing is we're not, we're not supposed to be cooped up in a house all day and night. It sounds like you wake up in the morning and you take care of your toddler all day and then your husband gets home and you continue to stay home all day and you never leave the house. Again, that's not natural. We're supposed to get out. We're supposed to do things. Now, for some people, even myself, I, I'm, of the, I'm on the end of the spectrum where I don't mind being cocooned up in my place all day. Maybe it's a Seattle thing. I don't know. But, but, it sounds like you might be the sort of person that needs to break free and, and run, run in a field or something. I just have this vision of you running through a meadow and, and being free of any responsibility while someone else takes care of your child. So the other thing is, is it's also normal to feel the stress when you feel neglected by your husband. I don't know about your situation. Again, it, does, it sounds like you and him might have a good relationship, but it also can produce distress when you feel like your husband isn't helping out and you feel uh, unfairly treated or something. And so, so all these things are, are normal. And my advice is to get support and get people to help you out. You need other people around. Now, for some people, when I say this to them, I say, you know, you really need more support. And they say, who, who do I turn to? I don't, I don't have anyone that can support me. And what I say is, okay, well, I, I, I understand that. And as you move forward in life, meaning long-term actions and long-term campaign, is you have to stop being so isolated. And I totally understand that no one can just snap their fingers and instantly have a support system around them. So it might take a few years, but the whole idea is, is you need a support system. And in today's internet, Facebook society, in, in American society that makes you work 60 hours a week and you commute two, three hours a day and you have a billion chores and da, da, da. Well, one of the first things to be neglected is friends and support. And that's dysfunctional. So you got to stop that. So in the next year, are you going to have an instant support system? Maybe not, but you're, you're definitely going to need it ongoing and 
you got to start somewhere. And so you need to start getting support now. So, and it, it takes a bit of doing. And if you're shy or whatever, or I don't know, you don't like socializing and the way that other people socialize, that's fine, but you have to figure out a way to make it work. And it's not, again, it's not something you just snap your fingers. It's a campaign you go on. For instance, you say, okay, well, there's, there's a, you know, there's a few people at, at work that I kind of like, maybe we can be friends. And you try to make those three people and the friends and it doesn't work out. And the, the next step isn't to say, well, fuck it. I can't have friends. The next step is to say, well, it didn't work out with those three people. I, I have to, I have to look somewhere else. You just have to keep looking. And the thing to remember is the vast majority of Americans anyway, wish they had more friends. And so if you, if you reach out, people will appreciate it because they're desperate too. The other thing is that I'll say the other piece of advice here is to normalize your situation. It's normal to be afraid of, of the responsibility of being alone with a toddler at home. Toddlers particularly, since they're mobile, can, can kill themselves. They can fall off a cliff or they can, they can eat some poison or they can, you know, sleep wrong and die. I mean, it's terrifying and parents know this. And so it's normal to be terrified. There's nothing, there's nothing odd about you that you are experiencing some anxiety. So just, you know, take it easy on yourself on that one. Also get out of the house. Maybe you, even with your baby, you know, take a stroll, go to the park, get, get play dates. You know, there are probably plenty of other parents in the area in your neighborhood that have toddlers that would love some adult time and you both bring, you know, say you have four different single parents who are at home and you all bring your toddlers and you put the toddlers in the middle of the room and they play and then you drink some wine and laugh. <laughs> I don't know. Just get, get, get out of the house. The other thing is get therapy if you're not already because a therapist might be able to figure out what the deal is. Also, have your husband take over when he gets home so you can go out. This is a sexism problem that's still highly prevalent in our society in which husbands will say things like, yeah, I help out with the parenting. I help out. And that's absurd to me. You don't help out with the parent. That's like saying you helped out with your, with the parenting of your neighbor's children. You don't help out with the parenting of your own children. You are half of the parental uh, system. <laughs> you are a primary caregiver as a father. And even if you work a lot, that doesn't mean you can just come home and act like nothing's happening and act like you don't have a responsibility. And in a lot of ways, I find that when you actually break down the, the labor distribution, it makes total sense for a husband to come home from work, take over uh, taking care of the children for a couple hours so that the wife can have some free time, particularly with typical jobs that most people have these days, which allows a certain amount of free time and autonomy, and you're not constantly having to watch someone. You know, when, when you have, particularly a toddler, when you're, when you're watching a toddler, it's very taxing on the brain because you can never just turn around. It, you know, maybe when they're taking a nap or something, but it's pretty rare that you can just like, just for an hour, just zone out on the internet or something. You can't do that with a toddler around it. So it's very taxing on the brain. Whereas a lot of other jobs when you're at work, yeah, you've got work to do, but you know, let's be honest, a lot of people working in, in the United States, you know, you zone out for a couple hours or you chat with a coworker for 45 minutes, you know, that that's, that's time for your brain to relax. And so, so get your husband to take over. I don't know if that makes any sense to you too, but that's uh, some, a conversation to have if you haven't already. Also get your extended family involved. That's, that's why we have grandparents is to have babysitters. They're free loving babysitters for the rest of your life. And so uh, get your extended family involved. And this is another little piece of advice to people is you might want you you have to consider living near unless you hate your parents but if you're going to have kids you have to live near your parents because they 
are often of the age where they have free time or at least are highly motivated to take care of your children while you take a break. All the couples I work with, with young children, uh, if they have parents who can take care of their children, it, it is a boon to their mental health. So get, get, your, get your parents involved with taking care of your children. Also, it sounds like you might need some relaxation, I'm guessing, at home, like monitoring your distress when you're at home, really trying to be mindful of where you're at and the sort of thoughts that are running through your head. If you're sitting there constantly thinking about the fact that your toddler could die at any moment, that's not going to help with your distress. And so just thinking about the sort of thoughts that run through your head and how your body is doing and if there's anything you can do to relax yourself, like uh, meditation or, or even just trying to relax your body, um, try to, uh, I don't know, caffeine can be a problem too. I don't know. Also potentially trauma recovery. I, I don't know if you've been traumatized in some way in your life, but if you have, then of course, uh, recovering from that trauma would be a good idea. Okay. Let's read some other emails. This listener wrote in and said, I am an avid listener of your podcast and absolutely love the kinds of discussions you end up having on the show. I am interested in what you think about friend breakups. Surely there is some sort of gender role to this sort of thing. And as a female currently going through a friend breakup, I get the feeling that it's even more heartbreaking than a romantic breakup. What is the psychology behind these kinds of breakups? So yes, hopefully there will be a discussion about friend breakup soon. I think they're, I think they are incredibly underestimated and not talked about enough in popular culture. End of quote. Yes, I agree with most of what you said, except for the gender thing. If you know me, I am a proponent and uh, and research backs up this this idea that the differences between the cis males and cis females is actually quite minuscule, if not non-existent. And the idea that men do not care about breakups or don't care about their friends in comparison to, to females is, is not true in my experience and not true when you actually look at the research. Now, we socialize men to act like they don't care. And we socialize men to even not have close relationships with other people because that is a feminine quality. And if, if you are vulnerable and create uh, deep relationships with your guy friends, that's seen as something that's feminine and therefore you might be gay. And since we hate gay people, then we tell men they can't act that way. So all human beings need human closeness and affection and, and healthy attachments, strong attachments. And, you know, women don't need that more than men do. Men, men need it just as much. And, in, and I've argued the point that when you deprive men throughout their lives of closeness, then they need it even more than women do because they have been deprived of it. So I don't agree with that, that assertion, but I agree with everything else you're saying, listener, in that friend breakups are extremely difficult for people and can be just as devastating, if not more at times, than a romantic breakup. Absolutely. And the attachments within a friendship can be, can be quite significant in people's lives. And in a way, I see our society as only really valuing romantic and, you know, spousal attachments and really downplay the importance of having friends. As I was saying earlier, we don't have enough friends and we don't value that. I mean, you know, we almost expect us as we age to not have any friends. It's like, well, I'm 45, you know, I don't really have friends anymore. Who needs friends? And it's, and you know, that's not, that doesn't make any sense. How could it be different when you get older that you suddenly have no need for friends? You need, you now, it depends on what we need by friends. I mean, there's friends like, hey, I went paintballing with my friends. And then there's, I know if I'm suffering, I can call my friend and my friend will listen. So there's different kinds of friends. But 
But anyway, um, yeah, they can be very difficult losses. Uh, and they'll, there's a double problem in that you're suffering from the breakup of a friend. And then when you talk with other people about it, they don't understand how much you're suffering because in our culture, we say breakups with friends are no big deal. If you were married for 25 years and got divorced, most people would at least have some understanding that you're going to be suffering for a little bit after that. Now, in all likelihood, you'd be suffering for the rest of your life, and people will pathologize that even though it's normal. But what people will understand is like, oh, well, you know, they're going through a divorce. It's tough for them. If you're friends with someone for 25 years and you have a breakup with that person, most people would think it would be no big deal to you. And so you're pathologized or judged or you are ashamed or something. And so that adds another layer to the suffering. So, uh, and, and the other thing is you'll get a lot of bad advice from people because when you, when you talk with, so say, you know, you have a friend, Jane, and you are going through a tough time with Jane, you're having some conflict. And then you go to your friend, Michelle, and you say, Michelle, I'm having this thing with Jane and I don't know what to do. Well, Michelle is going to say, well, just leave her. Don't just, you know, kick her to the curb and forget about it. She's Jane's, you know, uh, a B word and you don't need that, that S. <laughs> I don't know why I'm suddenly not swearing, but, but, uh, you know, that's the typical reaction you'll get from people. It's just like, ah, you know, forget about Jane. Who cares? You know, you don't, you don't need that shit. But what this ends up doing is essentially it ends up, creating very short relationships with people because when you enter into a relationship with someone and you become closer and closer and closer and more dependent on the person and more attached to that person, chances are eventually you're going to have a speed bump. You're going to have a bump in the road. You're going to have a conflict. You're going to have something that rubs the other person wrong. And the chance that two friends are 100% compatible is just unrealistic. So you eventually you're going to run into some, some snags in your relationship. But again, particularly as you become closer, because when you become closer, you start seeing the whole person. And when you become closer, you start exposing more of yourself to the other person. You let down some of the niceties that you might give uh, other sorts of relationships. And so it's, it's inevitable that you're going to have a conflict in the same way that if you are in a romantic relationship for 10 years, what's, I mean, how many people after 10 years can say, we've never had a fight, you know, that's no one would, uh, you'd think there's something wrong with that relationship. That that's actually the interesting thing. If someone after 10 years in a marriage, they said they never fought. Most people would say there's something wrong with them. <laughs> They're either too distant or, there's, the assumption would be something was wrong with them. They would not assume that they were 100% compatible. Having said that, there are people that never fight and they are 100% compatible, but it's pretty rare. So in the same way, when you're in a friend relationship for 10 years, what's the chance you're never going to have a conflict? Well, it's not very high. And so, so it's totally normal to get in a fight. And so the, the advice from outsiders should be, well, work it out with them you know, or maybe you look at it this way. Maybe, maybe Jane was hurt and maybe Jane just, maybe you just need to level with Jane and tell her that you really value your friendship and, and you're sorry. And you want Jane to apologize for something that Jane said. Having said this, I should have brought this, this email up with Umberto because Umberto and I are, are very close. We've been friends. Some people ask me like, who is Umberto? Is he a therapist or something? No, he's, he's just a regular dude. <laughs> he's a good friend of mine. And when I started this podcast, I, you know, I've been a clinician for 20 something years or something. And so I started this podcast and I said, well, it's, it'd be boring if it was just me talking, not only boring to the listeners, which I'm sure it would be, but it'd be boring for me. It's just funner to have other people around. I'm, I'm a collaborator. I'm, I, I like, people to, to work with. I don't typically like working all by myself. And so I asked one good friend of mine, actually, who is a therapist because, oh, it'd be good to have two therapists. And he was, he's a good friend of mine. So I thought that would make sense to have two therapists talking. And for a number of reasons, he said he didn't want to do it. I think mostly because he was terrified. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, he didn't have a lot of time either, but 
But the second person I thought of was Umberto. He's a good friend. And I thought, well, he likes to talk a lot. <laughs> let's have, let's do it with him. And so we've been friends. We've been good friends for 10 years or so now. We've, we've been in bands together. We hang out a lot together. There was a time in our lives when we were together, you know, I don't know, every other day doing various different social things and podcast things and band things. And, and so, uh, if you can't tell we're friends, we're not just, we're not just podcast co-hosts. So over the years, uh, we've had our, our fair share of major conflicts and fights, verbal fights that have not been pretty, honestly, they have been quite, quite ugly. And, and they're, during those or at, right after those conflicts, both of us had to make a choice. We would say, well, I, I guess that's the end of our friendship because we're not going to recover from that one because, you know, he said some things and I said some things and I guess that's it. And, and that would have been very, and, and I was tempted, we were both tempted to do that. We've had I can think of three major fights that we've been in. Maybe, I mean, we don't fight very often because we're both fairly accommodating people. But when we have fought, they've been over, we've, they've been over those issues where you, you, when you get to know the full human being, you see their dark side and they get exposed to your dark side. They get exposed to your, your triggers that, that trigger your, your asshole, <laughs> your asshole douchebag personality comes out in those moments. And, and you're not reasonable in those moments. And so right after those, those three major conflicts I can think of, we both had to make a choice as to whether or not we even wanted to see that person again. And we could have, I think a typical story would have just been, well, I guess that's that because we had a major fight. So, and I can't believe what he said. So fuck that guy. I'm done with him. But every time we ran into that, and I had those impulses to just run. I said to myself, well, let's look at the full relationship here. We're together a lot. We do a lot of things together and we have a lot of fun and we're, we're very close and we tell each other a lot of things. And at times there are conflicts. So in the same way with a partner, you would say to yourself, well, I really love him and we are very great together and I'm attracted to him and, and sometimes we get in fights and it's very hurtful. But when I think about the whole picture, I, I want to be in this romantic relationship. Well, that same mentality I believe should apply to friendships. And so that's what I applied. I said, well, uh, you know, if I'm going to be really close to someone, this shit's going to happen every now and then, particularly with a guy like Umberto, frankly, because he's kind of an extreme guy. I don't know if you can tell that, but he, he doesn't do anything in a small way. He does everything big. And so if he's going to have a conflict, it's going to be big. <laughs> and so, so yeah, um, I'm curious what Berto would say about this. Maybe I'll bring it up sometime, but, um, and we've talked about it cause it's, it's, I don't know. It's just the sort of guys we are. We talk about things along these lines. And, uh, so, so what am I saying? I'm saying that the listener that is writing in saying, absolutely, there can be tremendous pain around breakups with friends. But I'll also say, perhaps there's a chance of you reconciling with this person. I don't know what the conflict was over, obviously, and what that the listener is going through, but maybe there's a way through this. Maybe there's a way that you were very, it, it hurts to break up with this person because of how much, how attached you were to this person. And can something be worked out? Can you recover from this? It's similar to say infidelity. M many relationships have infidelity and many relationships uh, have to recover. They choose to recover from that. Inf they choose to stay together. And it's, it's undoubtable, you know, there's, there's no, there's no ambiguity to the fact that the person who cheated did something wrong. There's no excuse for it. They did something wrong and they, they did something on purpose that they probably had to plan for. And maybe they did it several times that was 
was undoubtedly going to hurt the other person's feelings and the person cheating knew that. And so there's, there's no ambiguity about the one directionality of the harm and uh, couples recover from that. They forgive, they apologize, they build back up. Well, in a friendship, it's possible, it's, it's often the case that when you have a conflict between two people, both people are to blame. But even if one person is 100% to blame, you can still recover from that. Relationships recover from that all the time. It just depends on how important it is to you. And also it depends on how realistic you are about your relationships. If we're going to have deep attachments with people, we're gonna have to recover occasionally from transgressions like this. It's just a matter of fact. And if you ask anyone who's been in a long relationship, if they've had to recover from, from moments like this, they'll say, absolutely. And, and you say, well, is it worth it? And they'll, they'll probably say, yes, of course it's worth it. If, I, if, we, didn't, if we didn't recover from that, from that problem and that conflict, we wouldn't be together. And I would have no one. I'd be alone in my life. <laughs> Every person that I'm close to has hurt my feelings. And we've, we've recovered from that. So I don't know if there's a chance of reconciling, but uh, if there is, maybe it's worth a shot. All right. Well, that does it for another episode of this podcast. Please become a patron of the podcast by going to patreon.com. If you become a patron, you'll get access to our exclusive patron exclusive episodes, (laughs) Uh, exclusive patron exclusives and other fun stuff. So please become a patron. We have sort of plateaued on the amount of patrons. Currently have, let's see, about 228. We're trying to get up to about four or 500. That's the next kind of goal. I think 400 would be a respectable amount. And so if you haven't yet, please do so because it would really mean a lot to us. It's a small amount of funds that you would be giving every month to something that if enough people do it, We can make this a daily podcast and something that I invest much more time into. And I think that would be quite exciting for our little psychology in Seattle community. All right. Thanks for joining us. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it.